To formally begin the program, please welcome to the stage the director of the RISD Museum, John Smith. Good, thank you, Deb, and good evening to everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you to the 42nd annual Gale Silver Memorial Lecture. Each year, the signature event provides the occasion to welcome leading artists, historians, and thinkers to the Providence community, and also to celebrate the enduring legacy of Gail Silver and her commitment to art, education, and to the RISD Museum. During her life, Mrs. Silver was a great friend of the museum and a dedicated believer that art can transform lives. For many years, she served the museum as a docent, an educator, and a member of the board, and she led not only countless tours for school groups within the museum, but she also traveled throughout the region giving lectures to audiences of all ages. And all of us at the museum and throughout the community remain incredibly grateful and indebted to Mrs. Silver, and I want to acknowledge the continuing support and enthusiasm of her children, June, Paul, and Susan, who are here with us this evening, and in fact, the entire Silver uh, family, uh, many of whom are here. So thank you so much for your uh, support. And now it's a great honor to welcome this evening's speaker, Paola Antonelli, to Providence. Paola joined the Museum of Modern Art in 1994, where she is the senior curator in the Department of Architecture and Design, as well as MoMA's founding director of research and development. She earned her master's degree in architecture from the Polytechnic in Milan, and has also received honorary degrees from the Royal College of Art and Kingston University in London, the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and Pratt Institute in New York. She's curated numerous shows, lectured across the world, and has served on several international architecture and design juries. She's received the National Design Award from the Smithsonian Institution and was named one of the top design visionaries by Time Magazine. She's a prolific author and her many publications include Talk to Me, Design and the Communication Between People and Objects, Mutant Materials and Contemporary Design, and Humble Masterpieces, Everyday Marvels of Design. Her groundbreaking, provocative curatorial work at MoMA and elsewhere has helped bring design to the forefront within the museum world. Her most recent exhibition, Items, is Fashion Modern, devoted to 111 pieces of clothing that have had a strong impact on the world in the past 100 years, was on view at MoMA last year, and was widely viewed as a watershed moment for both MoMA and for the ways that fashion exhibitions can be shown in art and design museums. She's currently working on the next Triennale in Milan, which opens uh, November, or no, March of 2019, uh, um, along the theme, Broken Nature. Uh, she's working on a book, States of Design, and on a new theory of everything for design. Please join me in welcoming Paola Antonelli. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Deb. Thank you to the whole Providence community and RISD community for inviting me here tonight. I'm going to wear my Janet Jackson mic. Yeah, yeah. I always think of her when I wear this mic. Am I wearing it right, Andrew? Yes, okay, perfect. So it's a great pleasure to be here tonight, and it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce to you Broken Nature, the uh, next 22nd Triennale di Milano, for many different reasons. Well, first of all, because I'm speaking to an audience of uh, designers and of design lovers. Uh, being in, in Providence is like being in Milan. You speak to the converted. And uh, uh, you know, I always tell people that I, I was lucky to grow up in Milan, and it was kind of effortless to be a so-called design expert, because when you go to the hair salon in Milan, you find people and as magazine, and then Domus and Abitare, and I think Providence is probably similar to that. So that makes me really happy. 
I'm also happy to be here to tell you about this exhibition because my right arm in this particular endeavor is Ala Tanir, who's a, who's a graduate of RISD uh, from the program of architecture. And last but not least, I'm happy to be here to talk with you because Kate Irvin, the curator of costume and textile of the RISD Museum, has just opened, well, it's a few months ago, but this exhibition called Repair that in a way interlinks laces interweaves itself with broken nature. So there are many, many different reasons, last, last but not least, the fact that RISD is such an amazing center for design and therefore for constructing the life of the future. So broken nature is the 22nd Triennale di Milano. It's the 22nd because the Triennale has existed. Well, you would, you would make a calculation and you would say 66 years. Well, no, it's Italy, so not really. There were a few, a few triennials were like jumped over and missed. So it's existed for almost 100 years. But um, it traditionally happens in the building that is in the park in Milan that was built in the 1930s to host exhibitions of architecture and design. And the beautiful thing is that across it, along its history, it has served as a way to show what architecture and design could do uh, to deal with the issues of our time. So, for instance, right after Second World War, the Triennale was devoted to the issue of housing. Or in 1968, the Triennale did not happen because it was occupied by the students. You know, so it, every time, it was really a commentary on the state of the world. Well, the state of the world today is broken. And whether you look at it from the side of politics, sociology, economics, or uh, science and the environment, it is broken. But whenever something is broken, it can be repaired, or at least we can try. So broken nature is about this. It's about, I, the, about what design can do to restore and to repair the threads that connect us to nature and that we have severed across the years, especially the decades and the centuries. Uh, it's interesting because we are not responding fast enough to the tragedy that we have created and that we are going through. I was really struck by the, an article that came out in the New York Times a few months ago that showed in Guatemala uh, a new view of Mayan structures that were thought to be a small city and instead using new technology were noticed to be a really, really big city. Well, the Mayan civilization became extinct over a period of 500 years. It didn't happen overnight. Actually, no big extinction was ever overnight, except perhaps the dinosaurs and the meteorite. You know, usually extinctions happen over a long period of time, and they might seem preventable at first, but nobody does anything, and then it's too late. And I wonder if that's what we're doing right now. And, you know, whenever I talk about the fact that I believe that we will become extinct, and I just think that design can help us design a more elegant ending so the next species <laughs> will not think of us as complete morons, people say, oh, you're such a pessimist. I'm not a pessimist. Um, I actually think that pessimists are the true optimists because they are designers. They know what the limits and the boundaries are and they make the, do the best within those boundaries. Optimists are just delusional fools. <laughs> so you know, so um, this is really what broken nature is about. It's about showing how we can do better uh, and have a longer sense of time. I really like this clock by Martin Bass. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's basically a film of two people that are swiping trash and following uh, ex exactly 12-hour intervals, and it's repeated in a loop. So we're like swiping trash very, very <laughs> slowly. But it's truly having a sense of time that is important. And we would like, indeed, for the Triennale to have three major consequences. We believe that the Triennale is for citizens, not only for design experts. And we would like every citizen that comes to see the show to leave having, this is first goal, having a sense of what they can do in their real life to play, to really practice this idea of restorative design. Number two, they should leave having a sense of the complexity of the systems that we live in. So um, every action 
has a consequence, but it's not a linear consequence. If a building falls in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and kills 1,300 sweatshop workers, stopping to buy, stopping completely any purchase of, of clothes made in Bangladesh is not the solution. That could actually make things worse. And we would like people to understand what the pressure points uh, are that citizens can actually act on. So something practical in life, an idea of complexity of systems, and the third important goal is to have people uh, feel a sense of long time. Intervals that go beyond the two or three generations that we physiologically are able to imagine. And that takes a little bit of more of an effort, but it's funny because this is nothing new in a way, um, and I'm, I'm not nostalgic of the past, but once upon a time, centuries ago, Humans had a sense of their position on Earth that was a little more humble. Sometimes they would plant trees that they knew would last their children and the children of the children and the children of the children of the children, and it would be okay. And it's only lately that the self-centeredness has become so pervasive that it has blinded us to anything that goes the span of a few generations. And it's not enough to have meetings and legislative uh, uh, decisional you know, gatherings like COP23 that happened uh, three years ago in Bonn. Legislation is important, of course, but uh, I truly believe in citizens' effort and peer pressure. I believe that the most can be done and pressure can be exercised also on governments by citizens. So even though there are legislators that are working on changing actually the regulations, I'll do my part as a curator and I'll try to to act and to, uh, and to work on citizens. Because I believe that that's what curators do in many cases, some curators of contemporary design. It's not our job to tell people what's good or what's bad and what's great design and what is bad design, but rather it's our job to stimulate people's own, citizens' own critical tools so that they can go and live in the world as fuller beings and as more active and agent uh, human beings. So the Triennale will act on this idea of changing behaviors. I really like this quote by Felix Guattari, without modifications to the social and material environment, there can be no change in mentalities. Here, we are in the presence of a circle that leads me to postulate the necessity of founding an eco-sophy that would link environmental ecology to social ecology and to mental ecology. Design can change behaviors. Behaviors can help to change the world. I really don't like that let's change the world motto. I find it, uh, once again, a little too optimistic. Um, but I believe that as designers, we can really do a lot to influence behaviors and to start a positive chain reaction. You see here the beautiful uh, image design by Anna Kulacek. Anna Kulacek is a Ukrainian designer that studied in Italy and that is now based in New York. She's a fabulous designer. And uh, what we asked her, what Al and I asked her, was to show uh, all of these points of pressure that citizens can work on. We did a very, we made a very long um, list of icons, and here you see just a few, you know, from religion to plastics to connectivity and privacy, to um, blood diamonds, you name it. There was a long list, of almost like a, a book of grievances, that could help us guide the show. And here is the complete identity. It's quite beautiful, I have to say. And uh, I'm happy that we're working. We're trying always to work with young designers, possibly um, you know, of the female gender, if we can. But that's my own personal agenda, especially in Italy. Uh, but, you know, another moment for that. Um, I also like, besides the quote by Felix Guattari, another quote that I use a lot is Neri Oxman. It's a diagrammatic quote, it's not uh, spelled out. Neri is a professor at the MIT Media Lab. She's a scientist, an architect, and also really uh, an unintended artist. I mean, what I really like about her work is that she can be very rigorous in her science and in her engineering, but the result is also formally elegant. Uh, but her theory is as effective. 
I really liked this Krebs cycle of creativity, which she published a few years ago. You know, usually when we talk about the coming together of science, art, engineering, and design, we usually show bubbles that come together in a Venn diagram, and then there's that area of magic, the poof, they all come together, and that's the place where everything happens. But in truth, what Neri postulates is that it's not a Venn diagram of haphazard encounters, but rather it's a Krebs cycle, it's a metabolic cycle. Art feeds into science, feeds into engineering, feeds into design. They need each other to survive. So the cells are linked together in a symbiotic and necessary relationship. And I find this very beautiful because it shows how we need to operate, how we need to educate future designers, and how we need to present design and art to citizens, you know, as intrinsic and as connected to science and engineering. So this is really a principle that the Triennale will work on, and uh, we will touch upon all the possible forms of design. You know, on the one hand, you will see fashion, biodesign, interface design, visualization design, interior architecture, and more. And we will study how they interact in this Krebs cycle, metabolic cycle, with, for instance, diplomacy, anthropology, philosophy, astrobiology. There are connections that exist that might seem unintended and instead are really the ones that can be the most effective. And we would like to show them during this triennale. We would also like to show possible strategies, as I mentioned to you before, that people can uh, employ in their life and that designers can actually focus on. The relationship, for instance, between new and old materials, you know, learning from old material culture in order to advance the novelty of some materials, or designing with energy, or reducing pollution, or instead harnessing pollution. There are many different ways, and we would like to have a good uh, catalog of possible strategies that can be used. And here are some more of the, um, of the icons that Anna developed. You know, I was telling you about the pressure points that can be used. There are many, and they range from the T-shirt the that exemplifies fast fashion, for instance, to instead the uh, little dinghy there in the bottom right that signifies migration on the Mediterranean, AI, and we can go on for a long time. Actually, she has an even longer um, list of possible icons. But what I would like to talk to you um, about tonight are just the different themes in the exhibition. This is not really how the exhibition will be organized, but rather it's what we would like to convey, what we would like to promote in, the, in our public. Um, even though we're just about five months away, we're still maintaining the taxonomy of the exhibition rather fluid. We want to really design it uh, on the floor. And so we're not really dividing it in sections. But here, I can tell you about our priorities. One of our priorities is to uh, stimulate awareness amongst our public, and we'll do so in many different ways, but we want to have at the entrance a, a room in which people will find a lot of questions and information, and possibly also these great NASA images of change. I don't know if you've ever seen them, they're online, but NASA has, publishing these has been publishing these images that show the same territory before and after. It's almost like the before and after. Before and after uh, 30 years of erosion, before and after 30 years of pollution, before and after, and after 25 years of uh, rising, raising levels of the sea. So it's quite amazing when you see true change visualized in images from satellites. So this will be pretty strong uh, an image for people to, uh, to digest. But then awareness can also happen with instead uh, uh, augmented reality apps that show the level of uh, fine particles pollution and that show also the levels of, of UV rays that are 
penetrating through the stratosphere. So there's many levels of awareness that we would like to stimulate in our public. Sometimes awareness can also be shown uh, with an art piece. There will not be much art in this exhibition. There's already enough biennials and triennials of art. We need our own of design, but still, there are some artists that really do it well and that therefore can be elevated to the role of designers for this opportunity. Uh, so I really love Trevor Paglin, of course, and Trevor Paglin um, ha is really, um, is really incredibly, um, incredibly capable of evoking um, fear or, or disquietness. To, does that word exist? I used to speak English really, really well. Now I'm spending too much time in Italy. Now I speak badly both Italian and English. But still, yeah. well, this is a, um, a, an attempt to render this cube of metal that is actually in Fukushima, but it's in the area that cannot be uh, reached because it is still completely radioactive. And it's a cube that is made with the material from the melted core of the reactor in Fukushima. So only an image of the cube will be visible in the exhibition. Awareness leads also to activism, and there's so many different ways to be an activist in design. And you know, activism is very important today. Activism is Boyan Slat. You, must, you might have heard about this young Dutch um, boy now. Well, he was a boy because he was 18 when he started. Now he's in his 20-something, still pretty young. And the Ocean Cleanup Project was just launched in San Francisco about a month ago. It's really a cleanup project. It's about having these barriers that can be redeployed in different parts of the world that filter plastic, at least the biggest fragments, and that are about cleaning up the ocean. Activism is also, in some cases, giving tribunals the tools necessary to prove that injustice has been made. There's a new discipline that was founded by a group of architects in London at the Goldsmiths University that's called forensic architecture. I don't know how many of you have uh, seen their work, either at the Biennale of Venice or elsewhere. They're quite amazing. They use the tools of architecture to give, you know, to give projections and reenactments of events that actually have happened and to empower tribunals to have actually proof. They are almost like expert witnesses. And in this particular case, Forensic Oceanography, which is a branch of the Forensic Architecture Studio, provided, um, provided proof to the tribunal about a particular case of a ship called Juventa that was carrying migrants across the Mediterranean and that kept on being bounced back and forth amongst different countries including Italy. So it's really incredible because one would not imagine that architecture could have this role, but it can. Activism is also trying to uh, find a way to convey awareness can be activism, the importance of thinking of water. This is Jane Withers, who is a curator based in London. A few years ago, she organized her first Wonder Water Cafe. What she does is she collaborates with uh, restaurants that actually exist, and by getting information about the sources of every single ingredient on the menu, she finds out what the water footprint is for every dish on the menu. It's important to know, you know, right now, one of the few cases of an awareness of, foot, of water footprint comes with genes, because Levi's has been quite outspoken in saying that there are thousands of gallons of water that go into making one pair of jeans, and that has really stunned people and has sparked this whole campaign to try and reduce that. So more can be done. Water, water crisis is a big deal, drinkable water crisis. Activism can also be making a product in a different way. I don't know how many of you are aware of the Fairphone. The Fairphone uh, comes from the Netherlands. It's already at its, its uh, fourth model. It is a cell phone. And it's made so that you can open it, you can change parts, you know where everything is sourced from, you can recycle it, so the opposite of an iPhone, right? So it really is about uh, changing the way things are made slowly but surely. So this is the kind of activism that we are uh, seeking as designers. Elegance under pressure that means survival. I was telling you about this idea of elegance, of behaving elegantly, even though we know that uh, the, uh, the 
it's a dire situation. And elegance under pressure might be very simply trying to be elegant even in the midst of like really thick pollution. Uh, I really love the work of Zhijun Wang. He makes uh, uh, anti-pollution masks out of really expensive sneakers. It's kind of a funny uh, play on consumerism. And on the other side, instead, you see one of the young architects pro program uh, projects at MoMA PS1 a few years ago. Um, we used to call her Wendy, but basically it was a structure that tried to have as big a surface as possible because it was painted with a paint that supposedly can clean fine particles out of the air. So trying to uh, make the best out of the situation at hand. There are many um, uh, citizen-led projects all over the world. I'm showing to you here two that are based in Mexico City to try and deal with issues like the lack of water. This is uh, Isla Urbana, which is a, a, a neighborhood that has decided to harness, to ga gather and then harness uh, rainwater. Or Parasitos Urbanos, this is an artist, Gilberto Esparza in Mexico City, that has made a more poetic take, has given a more poetic take on the fact that so many, um, so many inhabitants of barrios and, you know, the favelas of Mexico, in a way, steal sometimes energy and electricity from the uh, urban network. Or also, elegance under pressure is the, what's happening a, a lot in India, where many citizens are starting companies, entrepreneurial companies, that are about responding to absolutely necessar necessary um, basic needs in life. The clean birth kit is produced in India and can be deployed for uh, like 50 cents all over the world. And you know, um, birth death is still one of the biggest problems for so many women all over the world. So being able to respond to such an important issue in a very inexpensive and well-designed way is certainly elegance under pressure. Elegance under pressure sometimes can be also a visionary project like this, I Stupa. I really love this. It's about being able to, uh, to maintain a gla glacier also in the summertime, to construct it in the wintertime and then keep it in the summertime in order to have drinkable water and water for the whole population. And uh, it's really, they're really trying to make it happen in, uh, uh, in northern India. Elegance under pressure also calls for empathy. Empathy is a very important concept and is a very important principle in our life today. When the situation, political and social, and social is so difficult, there are two ways to respond to the pressure, one would think. One is hatred and xenophobia and uh, just closing gap. And the other instead is love for your, for your neighbor and love for your fellow human being. And that's what we would like to show in this particular triennale. Um, a few months ago, I bumped into the work of this amazing photographer from Los Angeles, Laura Aguilar. I was just taken aback by the uh, tenderness and the beauty of the bodies that she would show that would not normally be considered beautiful, but they were because of the love that she invested in them. And I really wanted to meet her, and I looked for her, and I found out that she had just passed away. Very young. She had cancer, and she died. And uh, I could never meet her, but I'm trying to have her work at the Triennale, because I think it's important that people uh, see it too and are moved by it. Other ways to stimulate empathy are pro uh, design uh, works that might be visionary. This work was in Talk to Me, an exhibition that I did in 2011. It's called Menstruation Machine, and it's a contraption that is meant to let people that cannot have a period, like men or uh, yeah, men, um, feel, <laughs> men, yeah, feel what it means to have a period. So it's almost like you can see it there. It's almost like a chastity belt, and it has electrodes that uh, stimulate your lower abdomen and give you cramps, and it has a reservoir is supposed to, to draw your blood and put it in the reservoir and then it gets delivered between the legs. So it's the whole experience. And it's rendered by, this is Putniko, it's a, a Japanese-British 
artist and designer, she always does the, she designs the object, then she models the object, and in this particular case, she pretends to be a boy that wants to feel what it means to be a girl, and then also she makes uh, usually a music video, so in the music video she goes around town with a girlfriend of the female gender, and the, the girlfriend is singing and saying, it hurts, right? And it's gonna hurt even more. So it's, uh, it's really interesting because this work cannot leave you uh, Im impassive. The reaction is either disgust or really emotion and, uh, and tenderness. And I had this latter, of course. I think it's one of the most uh, amazing example of real empathetic design because menstruation in so many uh, countries and cultures in the world is one of the ultimate barriers. So, an example of empathy, and so is also this incredible project by Thomas Thwaites. Thomas Thwaites uh, decided... You're there? Yeah. Oh, baby, what are you doing here? <laughs> I didn't know you were here. Okay, so I love this work that you did. So, Thomas, the goat man, yeah, he really, uh, he, he really became a goat in order to understand to understand better another species. So this is like ultimate empathy. Yay, I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> so it's quite great. And uh, uh, materials old and new. So this idea of connecting with other species, with other human beings, with other genders, and also to have an openness towards the past in order to build the future. You know. Um, Rebuilding, restoring doesn't mean always looking or moving towards the past, going backwards. Sometimes it's about building a future, understanding how the past used to be. I really love the work of Forma Fantasma. They are an Italian duo living in the Netherlands, great designers. And here are two projects that might seem different but are the same. So on the one hand, you see this uh, beautiful series of vessels, it was called Botanica. They're made using pre-oil era resins, so shellac, honey wax, with like straw and other fibers, so everything that does not have to deal with hydrocarbons. And uh, at some point in Milan, they were, uh, during design week, they were in the basement of the Rinascente. Rinascente is like uh, Neiman Marcus, you know, or like <laughs> Bloomingdale's. And they were showing people how to cook these resins. There were fumes that were going everywhere. I was thinking, my God, if we were, if we were elsewhere, they would close things down. But it's about really trying to learn um, how things were done before we started screwing everything up. And on the right-hand side, instead, is a new project that they developed for N uh, National Gallery Victoria in Melbourne and that they will continue developing during the Triennale, which is called Ore Streams. It's about showing that uh, electronic waste, the, the leftover computers and electronic parts, are not necessarily waste, but rather they are new materials. And really beautiful furniture and beautiful objects can be made out of them. See, the idea behind the Triennale is to present this concept of restorative design. Restorative design exists already in landscape design, but we would like to expand it to all forms of design and to also explain that it is actually not punishment, but rather pleasure. Let me explain. Restaurants were born in France in the 18th century as places where one would go after having eaten too much. So you would go there and you would have bouillon or chicory, just like this kind of cleansing, not so good, actually pretty disgusting foods that nonetheless would make you feel better. And it's only afterwards that this idea of restaurant became instead synonymous with conviviality, with pleasure and delight. Well, we would like to talk about the same life cycle with design, but we also think that we have gone already through the punishment cycle. We can already be delighted by doing better. Uh, and uh, that's what we would like to show with the Triennale, this idea of restorative design. This is one of the concepts that we discuss a lot. And um, this particular example of our streams is one of the commissions for the Triennale, which is another idea uh, that we want to push into the world. All of these Triennales and Biennales put a lot of un uh, unnecessary pressure on artists and designers because every event wants something new. 
And it's a pity because our ambition, or my ambition and my team's ambition, is for design to be taken seriously, as seriously as science. So we have decided to not ask Forma Fantasma to do something new, but rather to continue a research that we really believe in. And they started it in 2017, in 2018 at, in Melbourne. They're going to continue it in Milan in 2019, and then in 2020 they'll continue it at the Serpentine in London. And it'll become a three-year or more project that really adds something to the world, something that can be relied upon. Back to the idea of new and old material, um, there are some materials that are really uh, have become the heroes of architecture and design lately. One of them is mushroom mycelium. And uh, you see here these Mars boots that were in the items exhibition, and they were a response to the moon boot. You know, the moon boot was created in 1969 because male astronauts from America stomped on the moon, put their flag and on, and it was this triumph of uh, the future, of, a, of an idea of futurism, futurism that was based on plastic and hydrocarbons. And instead, Liz Tokailo thinks that when we'll go to Mars, we will not colonize, but rather we will try to find a new space to inhabit, and during the long flight to Mars, we'll be able to grow mushroom mycelium and we'll be able to grow the tools that are necessary to, to create a new space on Mars. So it's this whole idea of thinking also of space exploration in a different way. Biomason is a company that's making bricks using bacteria. They're also trying to make all sorts of barriers to reconstruct uh, the uh, um, the. Uh, the sea, the sea floor. Plastic glomerates is instead an artwork, and it's about fossils of the future, fossils that will incorporate bits of plastic waste. It's beautiful, but at the same time, it's tragic. And there are many different projects that we have found that talk about uh, plastics in the ocean, of course, and this is one of the most poetic. Another idea about materials is to try and substitute plastics. And I don't know if you know, but Lego has decided to come up with a new bioplastics that is therefore biodegradable. They're not yet going to change all the bricks. They're just adding a few uh, maybe little excessively symbolic pieces that are all plants, but it doesn't matter. It's a beginning. And for a company as big as, it, as Lego is, it can be something that can be emulated by many others. Other materials that are really loved right now by everyone are algae. And uh, bioplastics made of algae are one of the workhorses of this new foundation in Arles, France, that's called Atelier Luma. The beautiful thing is that what Atelier Luma is developing is not a blanket uh, type of algae, but rather a blanket method for every part of the world to use their own algae. And I'm sure that you have algae like Milan, has algae, and the idea is to create these beautiful vessels, once again, formal elegance, no need to be uh, atoning uh, aesthetically, um, to produce objects and vessels made of the algae that are local. Processes old and new, just like materials. One of the oldest processes in the world is hand you know, handcrafting uh, objects. And interestingly, the people that know how to use their hands, how to repair, how to really fix things, which is one of the most important uh, aspects of our culture today, tend to be the migrants that Europe is uh, right now dealing with in sometimes not very civilized ways. So some of the most interesting examples of activism are, have to do with this old processes with employing immigrants from different parts of the world that are coming into Europe to make beautiful objects that are then sold in uh, uh, great boutiques. Well, what you see over here on the left-hand side is actually a quite ideological project because it is an autoprogettazione, which was a project by Enzo Mari, a really amazing Italian designer, a project that he did in 1974 to let people know that everyone can be a designer. He basically uh, 
spread blueprints of furniture that everybody could make. And actually, these migrants are making that furniture and then selling it in an art gallery uh, in Berlin. And instead, on the right-hand side, um, are designers from the Netherlands working with makers and manufacturers from all over the world and designing for the migrants. So the designers are not designing what they want, but rather are designing what would be best manufactured by the people according to their expertise. So it's really interesting to see how collaboration and is one of the oldest processes of all. Another great process is that of co-creation. Um, what you see here is a project by Elemental. Elemental is an architecture company in Chile. This is a rather old project, but it's a very fascinating one. You know, architects traditionally have been really about uh, making their own mark on the world, at least the star architects that we all know, all the Pritzker Prizes. Alejandro Aravena, who's one of the founders of this group, got a Pritzker Prize, but he got a Pritzker Prize for doing the opposite thing. What you see here is almost like the starter, the spark for a new community. In Chile, there's a, a form of social capitalism uh, that enables every single um, person or a single, single family nucleus that needs it to get a once-in-a-lifetime subsidy to own a house. It's a subsidy that is not huge, but it's enough to buy this kind of starter kit for a house. It's a two-floor, uh, five-rooms uh, starter kit that is already arranged around a cul-de-sac, because we know the cul-de-sac is the beginning of a community, and it has been designed by these Pritzker Prize architects. So it's quite beautiful to see how co-creation, letting people design and manufacture together with the designers, has become a process for building. At another level, at a molecular level, new processes enable us to synthesize cells using software. This is the company Autodesk that used to do the, pro the automated design CAD systems and then 3D printing, and right now they're doing virus-making software. And actually, we acquired one of their viruses into the collection of MoMA, and uh, we couldn't acquire the virus itself, of course, so we acquired a 3D-printed model of the virus. So you see, design goes the way of architecture. You cannot acquire the real thing, so you acquire a model. It's fascinating to see how design is changing lately. Another beautiful process is about trying to, um, to reduce the number of materials that go into the making of an object so that they can be disassembled and recycled more cleanly. I like very much this idea of bio-welding that's been developed by the um, Skylar Tibbets at MIT. It's about structures that jam together without any need for mortar or glue. So it's about creating walls and creating buildings that can be disassembled almost mechanically. Not to mention the idea of designing with climate. Philippe Graham is a Swiss architect that's been working in Paris for a really long time, and he always starts the design of his architectures looking at the climate, the temperature, humidity, sound, noise, and starts every kind of architecture, whether it's an apartment or a park, by taking that into account so that he can minimize and optimize materials and space around the immaterial uh, idea and reality of climate. So you see there are so many different new ways to design and build, and it's so important to, uh, to try and let people know about them so that many designers can embrace them and so that citizens can also maybe demand them. Wasteline, this is misspelled on purpose. It's the idea of thinking of waste in a different way. You know, what Forma Fantasma, what Simone and Andrea talk about, about waste being not waste but rather a new material, is very important to take into account. Maya Pedal is a company in Guatemala that now has kind of disappeared. It was really big a few years ago and taken really as an example. They would recycle all parts of bicycles and other vehicles to make, um, to make tools and 
different equipment for agriculture and for domestic life. And it was an example of how to really transform waste into new objects. Right now, also, uh, the idea of in informing waste and including waste in the whole life cycle of a community has become very important. And I like the fact that in some communities it can be seamlessly uh, introduced by using also the vocabulary, the formal vocabulary of that particular community. I like this company called Daily Dump that uh, is for composting and it's in India. I have to say that some of the most interesting contemporary design comes from India because it has this kind of seamlessness and this uh, um, almost immediate response to necessities. But one of the most important uh, aspects of this idea of waistline is to try and reduce waste as much as possible. You're seeing here a picture of the piles. The piles is this gigantic second-hand clothes or third or fourth-hand clothes in Johannesburg, South Africa, that has been hailed by so many as a place for creativity. And indeed, many designers go there to then design their wares and recycle and reuse. But the truth is, it's really too much. And there's too much waste that is produced, especially in the fashion world, that needs to be curbed. I remember that a few months ago, there was this article in the New York Times that says, for dignity and development, East Africa curbs used clothes imports. This idea that we can discard, that there's a, it, it's almost like a, a, a new form of colonialism, the waste colonialism, that needs to be really eradicated. And once again, it's about um, making people realize that we live in complex systems, that it's not just the act of discarding by sending to Africa. I mean, what is... What does it mean to send to Africa? It's about instead trying to curb at the source. So not trash, but rather new materials. Um, there's many designers that have started showing how we can reuse and recycle in, in inventive ways. Martino Gamper is uh, an Italian designer that's working and living in London, and several years ago, he did a project that became almost a manifesto. It was called 100 Chairs in 100 Days, so it was almost like a performance. Every day he would go around London, pick up pieces, and make a chair with those pieces, and that went on for 100 days. And the chairs, you know, some of them are quirky, some of them are not that comfortable, but it's almost like a manifesto. And then he went on uh, just really promoting this idea of repair um, by also putting together repair stations in front of the Rinascente, the same Rinascente where they were cooking the resins, the big department store in Piazza del Duomo in Milan, by having these repair shops outside that people could use to cane their chairs or to repair their bicycles, to have this sense that things don't need to be thrown out but rather can be fixed. And uh, it's very interesting because one of the subtle ways in which um, my team and I are hoping to make a change is by declaring any time we can that we have banned from our vocabulary the words consumption and consumers. They, I, I am always stunned by how normally these words are used. They are words that we should be slightly disgusted by and that we should aspire not to have in our vocabulary. So slowly but surely, we hope to be able to make that change. But back to the reusing uh, of waste as a new material. Ilka Suppanen is a Finnish designer that worked with a lot of people in Sao Paulo to make these great robots out of like trash also, trash as a new material. Look at this. You know, it's so interesting to see how far recycled plastic has gone. I remember at the beginning, like in the 1990s, it was this horrible confetti, you know, that you, you saw everywhere with like this kind of psychedelic, uh, oppressive uh, motif. And then I remember in 2006 when Coca-Cola launched the PET recycling project together with the um, American furniture company Emeco, it was already quite clean, but still uh, a little bare bone. And now instead we have chairs like Dirk van der Kooij's endless chair that's made robotically using the interiors of, of uh, wasted refrigerators. Beautiful, elegant, comfortable, and also customizable. So 
it is about starting a process and then carrying it on. It's going to take time, but we're going to move away from chicory and bouillon and uh, go to, back to foie gras. Uh, and you see here, that's where we are with recycled plastic. The, the Parlay for the Oceans uh, company has been promoting the use of like ocean plastics for a really long time. And these are some of the collaborations they did, especially with Adidas and Nike. So you see, this is what recycled plastics looks like today. It doesn't look like recycled plastics at all. It looks like whatever, it's just like an interesting material. We don't have to make that distinction anymore. We can make that recycling, reusing, being ethical, being more responsible become normal. We can reach a new baseline and then enjoy and really do something new. Repair. I mean, this is dedicated to Kate, but it's also um, an important concept in the exhibition. Ala and the team and I use the word reparations a lot. And it's a word that is very loaded, especially here in the United States, because it's about slavery. It's about um, fixing a wrong, uh, even after a long time. And I've been having many discussions with friends that are African-American and, uh, um, and that say that I shouldn't use that word. But I would like to get to the point, I'm still using it in a very acerbic way, but I want to get to the point that I can use it in the exhibition in a very assertive way because it is about righting a wrong and it is about having enslaved nature and having uh, taken a very wrong stance of self-centeredness and arrogance that we need to change. And uh, I think that by using a word that is so complicated and so loaded, I might get uh, results and I might get also pushback that will allow me to uh, actually describe the theory even with more detail and more correctness. But going back to the simple concept of repair, there's um, a whole movement called Fixperts that started in, in London with Daniel Charney, who's a graduate of the Royal, Royal School of Art, that is all about creating a catalog of how to fix things so that people can learn how to fix everything from you know, helping um, elderly people. You know, like I, I did one of this, I took one of these catalog items and I made it for my mother to wear socks and uh, uh, have an easier time. And it's about really trying to fix things when they don't work and make them better when they work but could be improved. Um, repairing might also mean instead, at a very different scale, repairing the sandbar of the Maldives. The same uh, Schuyler Tibbets that did those jammable structures that tries to avoid glues and mortars is also working with the government of the Maldives to study scientifically how sandbars can be rebuilt by putting a few, uh, a few kind of incidental objects in the, uh, in the floor of the ocean, almost as if it were the uh, kind of dirt that starts a new pearl. So they're working with scientists and engineers and the government to see how they can rebuild the eroded sandbars of the Maldives. Similarly, in Australia, Alex Goad is working on a new way to replenish and rebuild the coral reef. We know what a problem that is, and Mars, this project, is a way to actually jumpstart coral again. Once again, a process that will take so many generations, but that needs to be started sooner rather than later. The same Sputniko that did the menstruation machine also came up with this completely different poetic and speculative idea of how to replenish and repair Fukushima by having these beautiful heels that she can strut uh, with in the soil of Fukushima and plant new seeds that can then in a few generations also rebuild the soil. So there are many different ways and many different responses and there are partners old and new in design and in life. Neri Oxman works a lot with uh, also animals that become part, natural part, of the cycle of making. And in this case, she made a silk pavilion that was made by dozens of thousands of uh, silkworms that were given the right condition to build the pavilion. So in a way, the architects and the engineers study how the silkworms behave and then create the conditions for that particular pavilion to happen. It's almost like 
studying, it's almost as if the silkworms were perfectly unionized and told the architects how the, they should be used in order to make that building that way. But the idea of building with nature is one of the ultimate goals for so many designers and engineers. Um, new partners are bacteria. They're old partners, but we have become much more con conscious of our microbiome. And uh, many architects and designers are actually taking it into account as they build, as they build subway stations and they check and take a swab of the station to see what microbes are there, and as they create and build in different climates. This is a, an, a manga in Japan called Moya Shimon. It's about a boy that can see and speak to bacteria. It's really wonderful. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, it's quite great. Um, partners old and new humanoids have become a very fascinating subject. You know, the difference between a robot and a humanoid is that a humanoid really looks like a human. And it's creepy for some of us, you know, especially in the West, the more, uh, the more robots look like us, the worse it is. And instead in the East, there's much more, uh, there's much more comfort with uh, robots looking exactly like a person. You see here Matsuko Deluxe, who is a, a television anchor in Japan, a cross-dressing, um, really funny comedian, and commentator, and he is having a, a television program every week with a humanoid that looks exactly like him that's called Matsukoroid. And people tune in and they really see, the, they really watch the two having their conversation. And um, the humanoid was uh, created by Hiroshi Shigura, a professor at the University of Osaka. He's not a prof professor of robotics. He studies the relationship between humans and machines. So it's fascinating, this idea that um, we, our nature can be also transferred to machines in the future is something that we might want to study because it will be a reality. And the same will happen with strategic augmentation. Stronger, faster, smarter, how to make the best out of the situation at hand and actually improve it. Hugh Herr, on the left-hand side, is a professor of biomechatronics at the MIT Media Lab. He's a double amputee himself, and he started out by uh, working on his own body in order to bring himself back to his capacity before the accident that rendered him um, paraplegic. But then he realized early on, and that's something that so many other scientists are studying, that the same prosthesis could be used by so-called normally abled people to become supernormal. The idea that we could do without cars and other vehicles because we could have exoskeletons or prosthesis that make us walk faster, run faster than cars, is something that has been uh, displayed a lot and discussed a lot in science fiction, but could become a reality. On the right-hand side, you see a couple in the real world, uh, Neil and Moon. Neil is actually colorblind, and he implanted a chip in his, in his brain that uh, allows him to see colors through a camera on the outside. So the colors get transformed into electrical stimuli and he sees the colors directly without having to deal with the transference of the eyes and the retina. Moon is his wife. She doesn't have any kind of uh, so-called shortcoming, but she implanted a chip in her elbow that allows her to feel earthquakes that are happening in different parts of the world. She's an artist performer, so that makes sense. But so can you imagine having this continuous connection? She can turn it off. But uh, yeah, but it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. So this idea of strategic augmentation that also could allow us to be safe. This is Patrizia Piccinini. She is a, an Australian artist that I really love. She does uh, strange beings that are uh, adorable, not this one in particular. This is Graham. It's, she, he's not adorable, but he is what a human being should be to withstand a 50 miles an hour uh, frontal crash. So, you know, it's really quite fascinating to, yeah, that's it. I know it's pretty disgusting, but so um, I like to see what our physiology could be. Hopefully not like this. I think we should get rid of cars before we become like that, but who knows? It could be our next evolution. Um, 
And uh, the work of Lucy Jones is also quite fascinating. Lucy is a great fashion designer who works for people that uh, have disabilities, especially people that are on wheelchairs. I mean, her basic tenet is why should they not be as fashionable as people that instead can wear pantyhose while standing, right? So for items, she designed this really beautiful pantyhose for people on wheelchairs, and she designs all sorts of, uh, of clothes that are changed for uh, to match elbows and knees of people that are seated for a really long time. So strategic augmentation or modification is important. And I was telling you before about the necessity to explain to people about cycles and systems. The fact that uh, things can have a life cycle and the life cycle can continue in other objects is something that is exemplified quite beautiful by this uh, concept of transitory yarn, uh, which also will be part of the exhibition. We will have, we don't know yet what we're gonna show. You know, in some cases, it's, uh, it's about showing something in motion and we'll see how that can happen. But also we would like to rely on visualization design and especially on the work of Giorgia Lupi who is a great mm, Milanese also, sorry, designer that's living in uh, New York. This is what she did for items. It was uh, a diagram at the end of the exhibition that showed all the 111 items of clothing uh, that were put in, in connection with the United Nations Sustainability Goals for 2020 to see how they were faring. It was showing how the Levi's 501s were doing, how the Adidas and the Nike, the Adidas Superstar were doing. It was showing the efforts of different companies to try and reduce their footprint. So it's about giving a sense of big systems. Because in the end, we have to think of the life cycle, not only of objects, but also of humankind. There are a few projects, and this we're getting to the end of our conversation also, but there are a few projects that really talk about this sense of, uh, of eternity versus mortality. I'm trying, I don't know yet if I'll be able to because I'm looking for the funding, but I'm really keeping my fingers crossed. I'm trying to bring to the Triennale di Milano this amazing project that was in Paris at the Fondation Cartier that was inspired and uh, worked on by Bernie Krause. Bernie Krause is a bioacoustician. He's a wonderful scientist that is based in California and that for his whole lifetime collected the sounds of nature. Actually, his archive went down in flames in the Montecito fires last year, unfortunately, but a lot had been duplicated and we're thankful for that. But this is a great installation that was done by him together with a group called United Visual Ar Artists that showed, uh, visualized the sounds of all these different uh, ecoscapes. So it's a beautiful work that shows, uh, that shows and also uh, um, plays the sounds of nature and shows also some of the sounds that are disappearing. One Life Remains is also something that uh, belongs to the title of a video game. This is a video game that's called Generation by the company called One Life Remains. It's a video game that you will not be able to finish in your lifetime. So you will have to leave it to your kids and maybe they will have to leave it to somebody else. And it's once again about making people think about the limits of our understanding of lifetimes. And I would like to show you also this beautiful project by Neri Oxman that's called When Death Becomes Air. It is a death mask. It's a death mask that is inspired to, by the beautiful title of a book by Paul Kalanithi, who uh, was an oncologist that discovered he had cancer and chronicled his last uh, months of life until he died and his breath became air. I think it's so beautiful, also very poetic. So Neri found a way to capture a human breath by using fluid dynamics and uh, uh, digital rendering and then printed in 3D in this beautiful object that is like a mask. Of course, uh, it would be a great possibility to really capture the last breath of a person to feel this passage of time. 
But in the meantime, it's a great way to also show how digital technology has brought us closer to the most poetic and, and organic and uh, biological of methods. Maybe one day we will be able to resuscitate species. You might be familiar with Stuart Brand, he of the Good Earth Catalog, the great guru of California in the 1960s and 70s. His latest venture, he's part of the Long Now Foundation, and his latest venture is an attempt to resuscitate species, but we're not talking Jurassic Park. He's not trying to resuscitate a T-Rex. He's trying to resuscitate the passenger pigeon. They used to be the most common bird in America at the beginning of the 20th century and is now completely extinct. So it's about this minutia that really make an ecosystem, not the dinosaurs, but rather these animals that were part of our familiar life and were part of our ecosystem and have gone completely lost. So the commissions for the exhibition, as I told you, Forma Fantasma will continue their work on electronic waste. Neri Oxman will work on this beautiful new uh, project that uses melanin as an architectural item. And she's going to work on a new kind of wailing wall with reactive melanin that is going to use the color of skin as something to atone and to cry over. So it's a, a real monument to prejudice, against prejudice. And the third commission is going to be by uh, the architecture collective Sigil that's based mostly in Dubai and in Beirut that usually continues a, a, a work that is based on architecture, but that is always connected to Syria and to what's going on in Syria. There will be other commissions, but these are the three most important ones. And we already have a website that's called Broken Nature. It's brokennature.org. And on the website, you can read posts, also by Bernie Krause, some quite beautiful posts, but also we're publishing a list of everything that we're looking at. We would like to make the process of curating the exhibition more transparent and even more, um, I don't know, I, more open, you know, so people can let us know and can also suggest other ideas. And we also have a wonderful advisory committee to help us, thank God, and uh, I say thank God because it's always great to ask for help. This is something that I learned some years ago. But if you ask for help, uh, people really want to help, and exhibitions get so much better. So we have experts from different parts of the world and uh, from different parts also of the human knowledge, and you see them here. And we, we hope that really we will be able to convey all this. It's a very ambitious project. We want to stuff a lot into a few months that we have left between now and March 1st when the exhibition will will open. But hopefully we'll succeed, and at least, even though we will not be able to finish everything, we'll come up with not very good answers, but with really, really excellent questions. Because once again, the job of designers and curators and scientists is not necessarily to come up with final uh, uh, resolutions and, uh, and uh, solutions to problems, but sometimes it's to posit the problems in the best way. So I thank you very much for listening, and uh, I am here to answer your questions if you have any. Thank you. And those of you who are tired can leave, and I'm not going to hold it against you. But instead, if anybody has questions, I would love... There's one over there. Yes. Oh, red turtleneck. <laughs> Hi, good evening, Paola. As a young museum professional, I'm also invested in the ideas of activism and social change. And so I'm wondering, in the continuation of those dialogues, what do you think is most needed in the next generation of curators? The next generation of? Curators. Of curators. I think that the next generation of curators has to attend more uh, social justice and political events and, um, and, and get out of their comfort zones. Like last night, I, I attended an amazing symposium at NYU about artificial intelligence and the ethics and activism and organizing about um, artificial intelligence. And uh, it, it, it taught me a lot because, frankly, we can be great designers, but if we don't know 
what we are designing for, we are going to be wasted, you know? So, and curators the same. I really like to connect the work that we do in museums with real life. Otherwise, museums might also have a problem of extinction. Thank you. Uh, oh, you have it? Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you to potentially speak a little bit about um, the exhibition or the Triennale as a design act, both as one that has a physical presence and manifestation, but also this bringing together of people and ideas into a, a, a very intentionally designed kind of event and system. Um, and perhaps more specifically, I was interested in um, when you mentioned the fact that the exhibition will rely in part on being laid out on site, and I wondered if you might speak at all about um, how you're thinking about the exhibition design, perhaps, in line with some of the propositions that um, are presented through the, the work you just cited. So I'm thinking about the enormous material um, mm -hmm. production yep. of an exhibition and, and how those two align. Get it. So we're working for the uh, installation design with a great uh, studio in Milan called Studio Folder. And they are, they are right now researching the materials, especially with two companies. One is a company by Daniela Ducato, who is based in Sardinia and does amazing uh, materials that are all sustainable and recycle, recycling and reusing. And the other company is MiniWiz, that you might know. It's a company based in Taiwan that also, um, at a much more industrial scale in much wider ways, is trying to really create a library of materials that are also architectural materials that are all based on the idea of recycling, reusing, and having a low footprint. So they are working, that's from a very practical viewpoint, from instead a more poetic and, um, and design and, and image viewpoint, they're trying to find this liminal space, you know, um, as you might have noticed, the exhibition is about nature, but it's not only about oceans and trees, it's also about other human beings. So they are looking right now in, in, in microbes and even robots, if, if we consider them a continuation of our own nature. So they're trying to find the right chemical uh, combination for that. The, it's made even more complex by the fact that the Triennale, I forgot to say it before, also has international participations. So the Triennale is part of the International Bureau of Expositions, which means it's like Seville, it's like Shanghai, it's like uh, uh, the Expo in Milan last year. So it's about countries from other parts of the world also bringing their own contributions. So in the Triennale, we will have also 28 countries that will uh, show their own broken interpretation of broken nature. And they also are going to be part or enveloped in this general design. So um, we're going to publish a bit online of how we're thinking about the design, but we're going to try to really, um, to really be consistent with the idea of the exhibition and to use materials that are uh, as much as possible sourced responsibly. Oh, you have it there. Thank you. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, um, this is very cutting edge material and you're very generous, thank you. And um, do you, how do you feel about the application? How do you, um, this is very cutting edge really. So um, do you feel that it's going to accelerate or move quickly or what is the progression of this, of this thinking, of this? Yeah, not everything is so cutting edge. Um, you know, there are some of the projects that I showed you that definitely are, like the mm -hmm. glacier mm -hmm. or, um, or some that are more speculative, like Sputnikov, but others are absolute reality, like the clean birth kit is very, right. very... Uh, well. Much. Or India. Yeah, so yeah. it's, um, 
I believe that this exhibition is like a showcase, right? A showcase. So. Um, I am hoping that people will come from all different backgrounds. Some will be entrepreneurs, other will be designers, other will be kids that will then pressure their parents. You know? So um, I just think that definitely, cutting edge or not, it's an attempt to influence a new way of thinking. Right. So uh, the best that I can hope is that some of, of what people see will remain engraved in their minds and will influence their oh, life. Yes. Mm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, over, he uh, over, over here also, please. Mm -hmm. This lady here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank um, you. My question has to do with uh, children's education because they are going to be the new generation or generations to inherit the mess that we're leaving them. And I don't really think that uh, what we currently do with children in schools touches on any of this. So I was wondering if you had any suggestions for ways to uh, expose younger children to some of these ideas. Gosh, you're touching a subject that I am so ignorant of, but that's why I have an advisory committee. Um, I don't know anything about curricula because I don't have children, so I haven't followed them. I know more about curricula in Europe, but I don't know about those in the United States. Um, it seems like the situation is very complex because there are some curricula that are dictated in a central way and some that are instead adapted. Um, I think that maybe some colleagues that are in education would be able to say better, but I believe that there are some schools that teach this, right? Or not, not at all. I don't know it either. I think it's incredibly important. It's not something that I know how to do, but hope, luckily there are really good people that are working on it. So, this was a complete non-answer. I, I feel well, I, I so inadequate. I mean, I, like, I don't know. I don't know a whole <laughs> lot about what kids are learning in school, but I don't think it's this, and I think uh, it should be at least <laughs> part of what they're learning. That's all. Uh, I'm going next. Um, from a curatorial perspective and the way you deliver your message, how you manage the coexistence between a lot of problem-solving projects together with a lot of problem-finding pro projects? I just, you know, I'm just going to put them together without making a distinction. I really would like people to, to stop thinking of design as problem-solving you know, I, but maybe because for so many years I've had to answer um, and, and explain the distinction, I want to see what happens if I don't say it. I might say that something is a product and something instead is a prototype or an idea, but I, I want to see if uh, I put them all on the same plane, what happens. That's just the idea. It might be a complete failure, but let's see, what, let's see if it works. Maybe we can Thank talk. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Paula, Paula <laughs> up here. Paula, up here. Hi. Hi. Um, a lot of the uh, stuff that you're showing uh, in the show and presenting uh, is very entrepreneurial. Uh, what do you think is the role of activism within the show? The, uh, the role of activism in, in entrepreneurship? Uh, within the show. A lot of the... Oh, within the show? A lot. I mean, I, I believe... Um, you can see activism throughout the show, but it's a different type of activism. I mean, there are many different types of activism that are possible. Um, even if you, I, I'm, going, I'm going again to the clean birth kit, okay? So um, activism is doing something active that actually works. So something like the clean birth kit to me is very much about activism. Um, I, I think that overt activism that really looks like obey and so on and so forth, in a way, is not necessarily the answer. I want to see if it can get under your skin more. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the role of fixing nature or trying to fix nature, I'm wondering what you think is the role of corporations or the corporate world, because there seems to be a lot of responsibility on the on you know the citizenry, but I'm wondering how you think that like higher power dynamics can also contribute to that change. 
I don't have much faith in corporations from that viewpoint. And uh, I believe that the best that can happen is that citizens demand change um, by using whatever weapons at their disposal, including boycotting. I mean, I got to tell you, um, there's another aspect of my activity, which are these salons that I organize at MoMA, R&D salons that are about topics that are important for the world, and I try to show what museums can do to help. And we did one on protest. And um, I find that I, I came to the conclusion that the only protest that I participated in and that worked in the past six years was canceling Uber, right? So that was the only one that really I felt had some effect that might have already, let's see what happens now. I mean, um, but something happened. And I remember when I, was, um, when I was a child in Italy that the Germans, who were always at the forefront when it came to environmental responsibility, had protested um, a particular facial soap bar by an American company that was too, pa too packaged, right? I'm talking about the 80s, by leaving, by opening up the soap and leaving all the package there at the supermarket, right? So I believe that the only, the only tool that I can provide comes from the bottom up, right? Top down, I don't know how to deal with corporations but I don't particularly believe that they will be the solution, at least not now. All right, thank you. Thank you. So maybe we'll do one more, unless you want to have final, if there's mm -hmm. something that someone hasn't asked that you want to share. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have one more? Oh. There's a lady, oh, okay, I'll get back to you. And then the lady over there, we'll do two more. <laughs> Hello, oh, Hello. yeah. Hi, Paula. Big Hi. fan. Thank um, you. Love your salons. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask and ask this question about broken design education. I don't know. Maybe you don't know much about school education, but design education, you degree shows. What do you see? What do you think design schools are lacking? What do you want to see more of? That's yeah. The thank you. Design schools are still great. The big issue are, is student debt, in my opinion, because um, I, I feel that um, there's so much pressure on students to find a job right away, uh, that there's that breathing space that enables, um, that enables one to mature um, a theory, a, a vision, is completely compressed. So I think that design schools are great. Some go up, some go down. There's life cycles. At some point, the RCA is up, then it goes down, and blah, blah, blah. But really, the issue for me is uh, that design needs to have a little bit of breathing space, and I don't see that it's happening right now. But um, that's what I can see from the outside. You might tell me better. I find student loans suffocating in every, in every different kind of uh, profession and university, but especially so when it comes to hybrid, creative, industrial um, uh, professions like design. There was the, the last, uh, the lady over here, then, yay, there she is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, uh, because of how you say you feel about corporations and everything, where do you get your funding for the uh, exhibition? Um, yeah, the, we, get, um, we get funding. So I particularly tend to get funding from one company in Korea, Hyundai Card. That re it's a credit card company that really believes in design. Um, corporations... So they still give quite a bit of money to MoMA. MoMA has an endowment um, that enables us to keep the lights on, pretty much, right? And then uh, we have sponsors that are corporations, individuals, foundations. It's really a mixed bag. And some corporations help us a lot. Um, but we were not talking about really the role of corporations in helping museums. I think that what, what uh, was being asked was really the role of corporations into this kind of awareness of the environmental changes that are happening. Um, 
so I'm, I'm separating the two for a moment. When it comes to museums, we're still counting on corporations, but I was discussing it even before with, um, uh, with some colleagues. We need to find a more sustainable model because um, we need to be able to give something back to corporations for them to keep on sponsoring us, right? And I'm not sure that we can give them enough, right? So it's a big conundrum there when it comes to museum funding. The Triennale is a typical Italian institution, European institution, so it's funded by mostly by government, both city, region, and state, with also a supplement of, uh, uh, of company funding. For instance, for the um, installation, the Bernie Krause installation, I, I need to find the money by myself because uh, because it's a public institution, the budget was set three years ago, and the bureaucracy is like, you know. But uh, so it's it's always um, it's fascinating finding money for, finding money for culture is uh, really complex. And I was so inspired when I came to the United States and when I went to MoMA 25 years ago because I was seeing these individuals that really believed in funding the arts and culture. It was quite fantastic. But when it comes to environmental responsibility, I'm afraid that profit still wins in corporations. Big, at least. Mm -hmm. So, we can go on forever, but I think, yeah. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Come and see the Triennale. Thank you. Thank you.